for y'all. Thank you for coming. This is a this is a big day. This is this marks the the culmination of a an examination and thought process that, uh, for efficiency and accountability that began some time ago. That'll be explained in a moment. Has resulted in a pilot program that resulted in the Offender Supervision Specialist Act that will allow probation, pardon, and parole to work more efficiently, more economically, and do a better job, uh, save the wear and tear on, on a lot of agents, and allow us to do a better job for the people of the state. And there are a lot of people involved in it, but the, the three leaders are here now, and I will ask them to come forward. First, Director Jerry Adger. Jerry? Thank you, Evan. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Governor McMaster for signing the OSS bill, the Offender Supervision Specialist Bill, and I also want to thank the Governor's staff for their support throughout this process. I want to thank the General Assembly for their support. Uh, more specifically, I want to thank uh, Representative Pitts, who's here with us today, and Senator Malloy. I also want to thank Senator uh, Sheila, who's not with us this morning, but she was also instrumental in helping us get this bill passed. It's very important to have this new position codified in, our, in the Triple P statutory language because we're dealing with the criminal justice court uh, process and we just wanted to make sure that we were standing on solid ground as we move forward and move from a pilot uh, to a more permanent uh, posture. So what I'd like to do briefly is talk about this offender supervision specialist position and the staff. And there's a difference between a probation agent and an offender supervision specialist. Uh, the supervision, supervision specialist, which we are known as an OSS, is a non-agent position. That means that they are not police officers. Uh, they do not be required to go through the police training to be certified. We also don't require them to have a four-year degree. And so this is a very different approach uh, to uh, working with our, the men and women uh, under our supervision. Probably the most important thing is, is that the offender supervision especially will be working with our low-level offenders, uh, those offenders that uh, have needs more so than being a, a threat to the public. We have what we call an assessment tool that identifies what level of supervision an offender may uh, be under. We are not arbitrarily putting people at different levels. We have a national proven uh, tool known as COMPASS that we use to make sure that every individual has, has been appropriately diagnosed in terms of their level. And those that fall in the low level will go, will divide into a, a different uh, population and go into the offender supervision, especially management caseload. Back in 2015, uh, during I think around August of 2015, we decided to pilot this new position. And we identified the four largest counties where we had the biggest caseload case needs, Greenville, Richland County, Charleston, and Spartanburg. We took 17 positions and we created what we call our OSS positions and we placed them in those four counties, dividing the caseloads between the high level cases and the low level cases. And the results of that pilot was just astonishing to me. And that's why we're here today. The offender supervision position reduced caseloads, agents caseload in the three largest counties by 47%. In Greenville, the caseload has been reduced by 61%. I think one of the reasons for that is Greenville was, was, has really uh, been aggressive in getting the people in place, getting them trained, and, 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 and they just sort of took the lead on that, and so the, so the uh, evidence is there in, in, in the results. Keep this in mind, in 2015, the average caseload in Greenwood, before we did this pilot, the caseload in Greenwood was one agent to 185 in 2015 before we did this pilot. After we implemented the pilot, it's currently one to 73. So it's a huge difference in the, in, in, in the caseload that we're, that we're actually having our agents to do. We will continue to reduce our caseload as we become more specialized in our case management. Just recently, this past legislative session, the legislators passed and gave us the funding, I should say gave us the funding, uh, for 20 new positions. And they're called domestic violence agents. So we're going to hire 
20 new domestic violent agents. We're going to train them, and they're going to actually take the caseloads from the current agents that are domestic violent cases, and they'll work only for the domestic violent cases. So our caseloads will even drop even more when we implement the 20 new positions that we have just received funding for. So in closing, I just want you all to know that this puts Triple P in a great position to better serve the 30,000 men and women under our supervision, while reducing the revocation rate by 46%, thus reducing the number of men and women sent back to prison for technical violations. At the same time, contributing to the savings of approximately $30 million over seven years as a result of following the mandates of our Citizen Reform Act of 2010. So this position, this day is critical to the agency. It puts us in a new position to really better serve the men and women under our supervision. And just wrapping things up, this position has helped reduce the agent's caseload. I just gave you those figures. It's boosted morale tremendously. And it also improved our retention rate. Currently, our agent's retention rate is at 90% and our turnover rate is less than 10%. So we're very proud of where we've come in the last two and a half years and where we're going in the future. Thank you very much. You. Representative Mike Pitts. Thank you, Governor. I'm Representative Mike Pitts, and I chair the uh, Budget Subcommittee on Ways and Means that funds law enforcement. It's where the law enforcement budget starts. When uh, Director Adger came to my office and said, I have a new program I would like for you to look at. He outlined this pilot that was and is the most innovative thing that I have seen in state government in the 16 years I've been serving in the state house. It is the most innovative. He said, I can show you a way to use the monies we have to be more efficient. That's something I don't hear often. Now I want to take you through a little bit of a history. 08, 09 when the recession hit, law enforcement got hit the hardest. Those agencies in law enforcement paid a price so that we could protect health care and education as much as possible from cuts. Law enforcement is a group that will take their mission and continue forward no matter what. It has been a long, slow recovery from that, and most of our agencies are still not up to the numbers of officers they had prior to that. So this pilot program that Director Adger was presenting to me was sure a breath of fresh air at that point coupled with the fact that we were just entering into sentencing reform that Senator Malloy played a huge role in, and we'll talk a little more about, I'm sure, was uh, tremendously increasing the numbers of people going to Triple P because those nonviolent offenders were no longer going behind the wire. That with accelerated arrest rates by those officers that were still on the street continued to climb and increase the numbers of people going to Triple P. So this pilot program came at the perfect time. And I, as, as Director Adger said, these low-level officers are playing a vital role. And by low level, I don't mean the officers are low level, the caseloads are low level. And it takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of the class one officers that have to go in the field and, and uh, keep a close eye on those individuals that are high level offenders. The guys that we don't want unsupervised have a, a, an eye on them more often and more regular now because those class one officers have a lower caseload. Director Edger, as I said earlier, you brought forth a tremendous program and it is working. We are also blessed to finally have a governor that understands law enforcement. 
that understands the pressures on law enforcement, that understands that it is a core function of government and plays a vital role in the mission of state government, which is the protection of public, public safety. Governor, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support of law enforcement at every turn. And I'll wrap it up with this. When a, a, a director can say, I'm going to save money and increase efficiency, when Jerry Adger says it, I believe it. And this bill today, the signing of this bill, culminates that pilot program and puts it into full effect. Thank you. Senator Malloy. Senator Malloy. Gerald Malloy. Good morning. Gerald Malloy, Senator from Darlington, and was the author of the Senate's Reform Bill in 2010, known as the Omnibus Crime Bill. Um, I want to thank the governor as well for um, his support and for his direction in this um, package. He was helping um, then, even back in two, 2010. To Director Adger, thank you for your leadership here with Triple P and the work that you have done. And Chairman Pitts, thank you for being a um, supporter of um, the Senate's Reform Bill and um, in support of the Law Enforcement Agency. Um, the Senate's Reform Package, what it did was this, is it said we had an evidence-based approach to law enforcement, to sentencing, to these issues. Basically, what we were doing is, is that it's cost savings, but the effect was is that people tended to, valid offenders tended to stay in prison longer, and non violent they were being released, which, in effect, created an increase in the load for the um, probation agents. So at this time, I'd like to thank the probation agents for their work, because they worked tirelessly for many years where they were understaffed and had more people than what they needed to end up managing. The effect is, is that we're, we should have cost savings, but we also have to keep our citizens safe. And so when we did the sentence reform package, we found out that 24% of those that were admitted to the Department of Corrections were in there for technical violations. And so normally in a technical violation, that's when someone didn't have a job, it was right after the recession, when they didn't have an address, those kind of issues, they were taken back before a judge. They were going back into the system. The most um, interesting and best statistic that we heard Director Adger say is that revocations were down 46%. That is a huge reduction here in our state. Director Adger came forward with the pilot program, and I think that what he wanted to do was have balance throughout the entire system. So it's efficient and it's effective. And so it's a benefit to the taxpayers here in South Carolina, so they're being good stewards for the taxpayer dollars. And so effectively what has happened is, is that every person that is under supervision does not need to be under the supervision of a badge. And so we got to use our law enforcement officers effectively and efficiently because those are our highly trained folks that we needed to end up lowering their caseload for the folks that they were supervising. So these are nonviolent offenders that may end up needing just a talking to, just someone that did not have to have a badge. So we're creating a balance between being a lock em up society and a rehabilitative society, which is there is a balance. As a result, what we've experienced over the years has been over 4,000 folks that are less incarcerated in the Department of Corrections, but at the same time, they're having to increase their, their caseload. If you look at the studies that have come out, what would be of interest to you is the sentence reform package has saved this state, get this, over $500 million, a half a billion dollars impact upon this state. And there's good news. There's good news is now at the governor's request and with some discussions, we're going to go into another round. And the Pew Charitable Trust, Pew Center in the States has agreed to end up supporting us in those efforts. Director Adger has made a request. Director Sterling has been involved. Um, Speaker Lucas and the President Pro Tempore, um, um, Senator Leatherman. And so what I want to say today is, is that the best is yet to come. I think there's more work on the horizon. There are things that we can do um, better and we'll continue to work. Um, all of this works well because you have leadership here in our state like Director Adger, um, what he has done and what the governor has done in, in support of this package. This particular initiative 
is going to end up being life changing for the um, probation agents that are out there because those individuals that they need to have the badge over is those people that are on probation now that are more serious offenders. And so what we're doing again is creating a more effective and efficient um, system and a way of end up um, handling um, the, those folks that are in the challenges of life here in our state. So I want to thank everyone again for, for being here and hope that you will continue to end up following the sentence reform um, debate. And we're going to plan again. Um, direct, direct, the address is going to be there in about two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any thank you. questions? Uh, we can just kind of differentiate. So what do you guys, when you talk about the serious offenders, like who's, who are the new trades, the new these officers going to be? What are the low level crimes that they're going to be taken care of as opposed to the serious offenders? Well, we, we allow the compass tool to tell us that. And what I want you to keep in mind is that, that the we don't just, the compass doesn't just look at the offense itself. The offense is just a part of it. There's a hundred questions, there's a lot of criminogenic factors that go into play before they actually determine what level of supervision. So we use that tool for that purpose and it's, it, you know, people will think, just let's take sex offenders for instance. They may, they may score low on a, uh, sex of, on, on the compass because they have a job, they live at home, they have never committed a crime before. This may be their first offense, but they're not going to score high. But that's why we have specialized caseloads, because if they're a sex offender, they're going to go on a specialized caseload regardless of that level that that tool tells us. So it's just a tool to help us identify the best way to do that. And we do that on a case-by-case -case basis. So in general, uh, what's some of the training that these, these new folks will be going through that will help them deal with these kinds of cases? Well, we've created policies that, that do that. We have uh, several uh, trainings, in-house in trainings that we do to talk about the different levels of supervision. They talk, they have to learn the compass tool itself and how it works. And also they have to be able to determine when a person's level changes because they start off on a low level, they may have some behavior issues and then they bump up to a high level. So all that's part of the training to help them identify and make sure that we're successful in carrying out this, this new uh, initiative. Any more questions, comments, statements? In that case, I move we adjourn. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Director. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.